Hey guys, following my last tutorial on the Nadir polarize function and the KA50 nav targets, I decided to just do a deep dive on the Gazelle platform. Parts of this tutorial I'm going to be doing with VR, and parts of it, like Cold Start, I'm going to do without VR just so you guys have a more stable experience on your end. Uh, so we're starting out in the mic model gazelle and we're just going to go over the cold start procedure now to start out you want to request ground crew electric power and the reason for that is because the nadir and the gyros take a significant amount of time to power on and they require ac power which implies that the turbine needs to be fully spooled up and uh, blades turning. So if, if you were to go through the entire startup process without ground power, you're just taking longer because after you've got blades spinning, you've got to wait on the Nadir for an additional 70 seconds and the gyro for an additional one minute. So now that we have ground power, we're going to switch our gyro to the GM position and after one minute these striped flags will disappear and they will read on. As for the nadir we are going to switch that to the standby position that's one click to the right. You will have the air ERR nav flags displayed at this point in time those will remain on screen for 70 seconds at which point in time we can then switch the mode selector to land. As for the rest of the start procedure we're going to start with battery alternator and generator and then our fuel pump switch. The fuel pump takes about 15 seconds to fully pressurize, so if you start the chronometer with the button that is on the bottom right, when the second hand reaches the 3 o'clock position, you can then go ahead and hit the starter switch. Alright, so while this is starting up, we will have the RLT yellow lamp and DEM green lamp displayed. The DEM lamp that is currently displayed green is for the starter and the RLT lamp is our idle lamp. So our starter turns off at about 22,000 RPMs. The idle lamp won't turn off until we've pulled ourselves into uh, or out of idle I should say. The block lamp illuminates red if the engine is blocked, in which event it will not be capable of rotating. So that would happen if it were damaged or the uh, the necessary steps haven't been taken to actually turn it on. So we can now take off our rotor brake and in order to do that it is located on the roof console. It is this red lever right here. We just need to left click that and drag it up. And now that our rotor brake is off, we can go ahead and start increasing our fuel flow lever to the 29,000 uh, RPM position for the engine. And the clutch will engage at that point in time. So just to clarify, the smaller needle is your engine RPMs multiplied by 1,000, so that's 30,000, and the smaller needle is your rotor RPMs multiplied by 100, so it's about to pass the 200 RPM position. And now that those needles are synchronized, we can continue pushing our fuel flow lever forward, slowly ensuring that we uh, keep those needles as synchronized as possible until we reach the nominal 43,500 RPMs, at which point all of our lights have turned off and uh, as well as our alarm light on the upper right side of the dashboard console 
and that alarm light will illuminate if the fuel flow lever is not full forward, the engine is above 44,300 RPMs, the turbine isn't rotating, or the turbine is damaged. So, moving on, we'll turn on our pitot heat. The hydraulic test switch right here in the middle is actually not simulated. And then we have our master arm switch, which we'll leave off for now. Personal preference, I like to have the dashboard lights on and the switches above that deal with external lighting. So you have your navigation lights and your anti-collision lights here. The normal operating position for those would be the up position. I'm usually in a combat environment, so I just leave them off. And then moving on, we can go ahead and turn on our filter if you have it equipped. That light will illuminate green if it is in fact equipped. And then we can go ahead and uncage our artificial horizon. Just left click on the knob and hold that down until it settles. The same for the standby horizon. Left click, hold the knob, and mouse will scroll to set the position indicator in the center. And now we'll go ahead and turn on some of our autopilot channels. We've got our uh, pitch, roll, and yaw channels, and then the autopilot switch itself. These gauges will come to life and center out. And then Again, just another personal preference thing. I like to turn on the UV lighting. It just makes the gauges a little easier to see, in my opinion. And our Nadir has fully warmed up, so we can go ahead and switch this by right-clicking at one time to the land position. And we see our, uh, our waypoint one, which should be our current position where we started. If, if you haven't if you don't preload waypoints, every waypoint will just be the position you started with. And you can load up to nine waypoints. Moving on, we'll just cover some of the avionics in the aircraft. Uh, but first we'll turn off the ground power. Chief, turn off the ground power. All right, so this, uh, this first gauge right here is your vertical airspeed indicator. It's measured in hundreds of meters per minute. So this first notch right here would be 50 meters per minute, 100 meters per minute, 200, 300, all the way up to 800 meters per minute. If the needle is in the upper uh, crescent of the gauge, that means you are ascending. Uh, if it is in the lower crescent of the gauge, you are descending. And then to the immediate right of that, we have our artificial horizon and then our forward airspeed indicator and this is indicated airspeed it is not ground airspeed and it is important to note that this is truly forward airspeed unlike the ka-50 you will not get a reading on this gauge if you are moving backwards or laterally left or right and then we have our uh, barometric altimeter this is measured in meters we have our Nadir and ADF gauge, so that reads all the way up to 99 decimal 9. And then this needle sitting at about uh, 1 o'clock position is for the Nadir waypoints, and the horizontal needle is for ADF waypoints. And then to the immediate right of that gauge, we have our torque indicator, and this is directly related to collective, so if I pull in collective, we see that the torque increases. If I drop collective, torque decreases. There is a red light here, and that light will blink when you reach 95% torque, indicating that you're getting closer to breaking your stuff, but you can run that light blinking for as long as you want. When you reach 100%, that light will remain steady, and after about eight to 12 seconds, your engine will cease to function. 
you can test that light and the torque gauge by left clicking the knob. You also have a, uh, a bug that you can adjust in the torque gauge. So if you wanted to use that bug, very much up to you. And then we have uh, our radio altimeter, which is currently displaying the off flag in black with uh, an uppercase A. In order to turn this on, it requires AC power, so the blades either need to be spinning at their nominal 387 rotations per minute with the engine at 43,500, uh, or you could have ground power. In order to turn this on, you just need to hover over the knob and mouse wheel scroll up. That flag disappears, and we can also set the bug rotator to uh, 50, 50 meters AGL. It's important to note that if you are below, if your needle is indicating you are below this bug, then this red LED will illuminate. You can also test that the radar altimeter is functioning properly by left-clicking the knob. Once it is powered on, you'll get a striped flag uh, in the in the indicator, and the needle will indicate seven meters. Moving on, we have our oil temperature gauge, and we have our fuel gauge. This is liters multiplied by 10, so currently we have about 290 liters. And then we have our voltmeter and our engine temperature gauge. Below that, we also have the uh, auxiliary fuel tank switch. And something to note with this is that when you fuel up your aircraft, you will have 100% fuel. So say, say you put 100% fuel in this aircraft Everything above 82.92% is going into the auxiliary tank. And in order to get that out of the auxiliary tank, this needle needs to be indicated at the 12 o'clock position. This notch that's between 30 and 40, that is indicating that you can then turn on the auxiliary tank and it will start pumping into the main tank. That takes about 15 minutes to transfer. It's the auxiliary tank is a 90 liter tank and your main tank is um, 437, I believe, 437 liters. So you have 90 liters auxiliary. And in order to do that, if you flip the auxiliary fuel tank switch to the up position, you'll start pumping if you have fuel in the auxiliary tank. However, if you do not have fuel in the auxiliary tank, the RSUP light will illuminate red. It does not illuminate green if there is fuel. It only illuminates red if there isn't fuel. All right, so I just want to cover the radios real quick. This is our VHF radio, and in order to turn this on, the switch for that is immediately to the right of the right rotator knob. So just right click that one time, you'll get a green LED here. The, uh, the frequency band that you can tune to is between 118 megahertz and 143 decimal 975. And then to the right of that is our team relay device, but this is not currently simulated. And then we have our FM radio below the VHF. In order to turn this on, just turn the mode selector knob to traffic it will immediately power on. All of the other modes turn it on and will enable to use it the same way and differently. If you turn it to test, it emits a 1000 Hz uh, tone. And in order to change frequencies, you have the uh, preset knob, and this is set up through the mission editor. Moving on, we have our UHF radio just below the FM radio. And in order to turn this on, you just switch the mode selector knob to the FF position. All of the other modes will turn it on just the same. As it's initializing, it'll blink on the screen, the default preset. And then in order to change this frequency, you just need to uh, select a frequency that you want to turn to. I want to tune to 251. So we'll enter 251000 and hit the validation key. 
and then it should be, if it is a valid frequency that we can tune to, it will remain on screen, solid. And since we're in the area, we'll also go ahead and turn on our uh, flare dispenser module. In order to do so, just flip the power switch to the middle position. That is technically the fast dispense position, and the forward position would be the slow dispense position. But that only applies if you put the middle switch here into sequence dispense at which point it'll launch, I believe, four flares at a time, and uh, it's kind of a waste to be quite honest. I leave it in the single flare mode, and just to save flares even more, I typically select either the left or right side first so that I have a total of 32 uses of my flares instead of 16. As the aircraft only carries 16 per side, and in single mode, if you have both sides selected, it'll it'll launch two at a time, so you only have 16 uses. If you drain one side first, you still have another 16 later. And then uh, we'll go ahead and flip open our flare dispenser button cover, and we're good to go in that regard. Below the UHF radio, you have your ADF uh, module. Uh, we'll cover that at a later point when we can see it a little better when the collective is out of the way. One more thing, and this is also personal preference, I prefer to have the artificial horizon selector knob in the DOP position, and that provides me with these vertical and horizontal bars, and those help significantly to get into an auto hover if you're not near the ground, where it's more difficult to tell if you're moving laterally or not. We'll cover this a bit later, but on the left side of the dashboard console, we have our RWR, you have the audio knob and the power uh, power switch. Croc mode is not simulated. The maneuver and page button is also not simulated. And you have your brightness rotator. So after we've finished our main startup sequence, we can go ahead and also turn on the Vivian targeting system. And in order to do so, we just need to switch the VCB power mode to on the IR mode to on, and our uh, VCB mode selector to slaved. You can power this on in the manned mode as well. Uh, that would be the 12 o'clock position. However, for traveling, it's best to leave it in the slaved mode so that it is uh, stationary and it's not trying to gyro stabilize on anything because that can also screw up the targeting system. And then we'll turn on our TV box just to ensure that the camera is functioning correctly, and it is. Following that, we can also open the button covers for the missile launch button and the button cover for the lasing button. You don't need to worry about accidentally launching a missile at this point in time because on the pilot side, our master arm switch is still in the off position. And that concludes the cold start procedure. Now I'm going to perform this at uh, full speed so that you can see what that might look like. Alright guys, we're going to perform this cold start now, starting with ground power. Chief, turn on the ground power. And we'll get our battery, alternator generator, fuel pump, magnetic brake, sand filter, trim, pedo, dashboard lights, we'll uncage our artificial horizon. as well as our standby horizon. Flip on our Nadir. Autopilot, starter switch, UV lighting. Take our rotor brake off. button covers and start rotating to 29,000 RPMs we can close the doors uncage our radio altimeter 
flares, radios, just waiting for the rotor RPMs to catch up, and we can start rotating now. Turn off our ground power. Chief, turn off the ground power. Give it a once over. Copy. Ground power is now off. And we're good to go. Alright, so now we're going to cover weapons engagement using the Mike model gazelle. And first I just want to demonstrate the DOP mode for the artificial horizon like I was talking about earlier. We have the horizontal and vertical bars. Currently the horizontal bar is indicating that I am moving forward because it is below the horizon. And the vertical bar is indicating that I am, I am sliding laterally left. So in order to correct this, uh, I'm just going to try to stabilize and we'll roll right a little bit to fix that lateral movement to the left. And now we're moving forward. and engage. All right. So now we're in an auto hover. We can hop over into our passenger seat and engage a couple of targets and I'll show you how to use the weapon system. But first, before we hop over into the passenger seat or uh, the co-pilot gunner seat, I should say, we'll master arm right there and we'll hop over there after we switch our BCB mode selector to manned and engage our autopilot slave. All right, we're in our co-pilot gunner seat now and we're gonna turn on the TV box. We had already turned on all of our VCB controls earlier when we were doing our startup. First thing, we need to turn the key one click to the right and we'll set our station selector to one that would be where your cycle stations bind comes into play there. And then we will locate our targets. All right, so we have this BMP here. We can see on the bottom left of the symbology here, we have a number four. And all that is in reference to is the gain of the image. So if we continue clicking around on the gain button we can either increase gain or decrease gain by default it is on 4 and then you'll notice at the top of the symbology here we have our deviation from the airframe which will remain 0 as long as the airframe is slaved to the Vivian targeting system and below that we have 214 and that is indicating our magnetic heading to target so in order to engage this target with everything that we have done prior with the station selector the key and master arm on the pilot side we get our launch indicator and this launch indicator will be there so long as the airframe is properly aligned and then we can also laze this target to ensure that it is within our engagement distance and it is it's uh, 1.4 kilometers and we hit our missile launch button. Now to engage the next target, we'll cycle stations. We get our launch indicator back. Missile launch button. And it's important to note that if you change stations while there is a missile on the wire, 
it will lose track and that missile will not hit its mark. Cycle stations, missile launch button. Cycle stations, we get our launch authority and missile launch button. Now, before we transition out of hover and we head on our way, we're going to put the VCB mode selector back into the slaved position, recenter the camera, and turn the TV box off. This will prevent it from remaining gyro stabilized on that position and potentially damaging the camera system as we are in a mode of travel. All right, we're in the Lima model Gazelle now, and a couple things to note is the radios have moved positions. So the co-pilot intercom system is on the co-pilot gunner side. The FM radio is on the co-pilot gunner side. The VHF radio has moved center console above the nadir. The UHF radio is still in the same position. And now we have these two new modules here. This is your weapon system power switch. You need to put that into the middle position, which will give you 8 and 240 on the screen as long as you have selected the appropriate loadout. That would be 8 rockets and 240 rounds, 20 mic mic. And then the master arm switches. The left one corresponds to your 8 rockets, and the right one corresponds to your 240 rounds, 20 mic mic. The ripple and single switch is not simulated, so you don't need to worry about that. And so, like I was saying earlier with only binding the right pylon, you'll notice that with the right pylon armed, it does not enable you to fire your rockets at the same time. So if you only have the right pylon armed, you can arm and disarm it with one bind and switch between the two. So, we're going to take off. And uh, I'll demonstrate how to engage some targets using the Lima Model Gazelle. Alright guys, we're coming up on our targets now. We're going to drop the pilot sight. And we will also master arm. At this point, once you've master armed and everything is good, you will get the green reticle on the pilot sight. We'll turn towards our targets. We're going to engage these BMPs with our rockets and using our missile fire gunfire switch that is on the HOTAS. We'll line up the sight, launch the rocket. And so now to engage the 20 mic mic cannon against these targets, we just have to switch on the uh, master arm switch for the 20 mic mic. All right, we're now in the Mistral model Gazelle, and you'll notice that the radios are in the same place as the Lima model. It is it's pretty much exactly the same as the Lima model, just with a different loadout. So same process, switch your power switch for the weapon system to the on position in the middle. Open the covers, master arm those, except the only difference here is both of these will remain armed, unlike the Lima model, because you're firing all the same munitions. Master arm on the pilot center console, and drop your pilot sight. So you'll notice as we hover around that there is a steady beeping, and that is exactly what you want. You have two rings on the site, and for 
best circumstances, you're going to want your target in the middle ring. So we'll line up on our target now. The range, by the way, for the Mistral missile is uh, about five kilometers. We have our solid beep now. That's our launch authority. We can go ahead and fire off our first Mistral missile. And it's important to note as well that these are fire and forget missiles. Shoot it and forget it. So we don't have to maintain a lock on this target. We can fire, turn away, and it'll do its job. We're just going to talk about the RWR really quickly. So if you look on the left side of your dashboard console, you have the RWR, and we talked about the functions earlier. The croc mode is not simulated. Marker button is not simulated, and page button is not simulated. You have a, an audio knob that you can use to turn the audio up and down, and a brightness knob. So the center icon is our own aircraft. The dots around the outside are increments in 30 degrees, and targets, uh, I should say radar threats, will appear on the outskirts if they are low priority. High priority radar threats will appear on the inside closer to your own aircraft. So I've been placed a Shilka just over this hill, or uh, near the base of the hill, I should say. So we're going to pop up at this time, and we'll demonstrate the sort of audio sound you will get from that, as well as it appearing on the screen and giving us a radar lock. Alright, so you can see that on the RWR screen, the Shilka shows up as a capital A, and the underscore that's immediately under it is indicating that it has a radar lock on us. Alright, so as you may have noticed with the Shilka, you, uh, it appeared as a high priority target with a radar lock indication. However, there was no launch warning, and that's because it is not launching anything. However, it is worth noting that there are a couple of radar threats that do not give launch warnings, such as the SA-19. I have now emplaced an SA-6 and an SA-8 just over the hill, and you'll hear the uh, radar threat audio tones come over the RWR as I pop over the hill, and you'll notice that the SA-6 is going to remain on the outskirts of the RWR as a low-priority threat, and the SA-8 will appear on the inner diameter inner <coughs> excuse me inner diameter of the RWR as a high priority threat with a radar lock and then you will also hear the continuous beeping from the launch warning so we'll pop up now so that you can get a good look at that Alright, so we've got one on the RWR there, maybe both, they're obscured by each other, they're pretty close together. That's our lock warning from the SA-8, and he is on the inner diameter there, indicating that he is a high, high priority threat. He lost he lost radar lock. There it is again, radar lock.
and the launch warning continuous beeping signal Whew. another one All right, we're gonna cover the Nadir at this point. So by default, you're in land mode and BUT parameter mode. BUT parameter mode is where you can select your different waypoints one through nine and edit those using the ENT enter key. I'll demonstrate that shortly. So I've gone ahead and set two waypoints if you don't have any further waypoints that are preloaded from the mission editor, all of the remaining waypoints will be the position that you start out in. So we can compare the uh, waypoint 9, which is the position that the aircraft started in, to PP parameter mode, which is our current position, and they are matching up. So if we switch to waypoint 1 and back to PP, this is our current position, back to BUT, this is our waypoint one. So moving on, uh, you have PP, current position, TPS cap, which is heading to waypoint, and the bottom line is minutes to waypoint. And if you are stationary, this will display all nines. BSDER, that is your ground speed on the top line and deviation from waypoint on the bottom line. If you're stationary, this will just kind of flop around like it's doing now. CMDEC, this is your current magnetic heading and magnetic declination on the bottom line. And then VENT, vent, this is wind, and uh, that's direction in degrees, and this is measured in kilometers per hour, so that uh, that is wind coming from 270 at 9 kilometers per hour. So we'll flip back to BUT parameter mode, and we'll, we'll go with waypoint 1, which is currently selected. And if we switch over to TPS cap, we can see that it's reading 307 degrees to that waypoint. That is the heading to the waypoint. We can also confirm this on the Nadir. ADF navigation indicator here. The large needle is pointing 307 degrees and we're reading 7.2 kilometers to that waypoint. So if we measure that out in the map, for example, 7.2 kilometers and it's reading 315 degrees, but keep in mind our magnetic declination is about 6.5 degrees so uh, that's that's pretty spot on. So back in BUT mode, we have a couple of options here uh, surrounding the digits in the center. Destination button, what this will do is if you're in another mode such as PP for example or TPS cap and you select destination 2, enter, this will change to waypoint two while you're in another parameter mode. And we can verify that by switching back to BUT. We show that waypoint two is selected. Your auxiliary functions, these, I, personal opinion, I don't think they're very useful. Auxiliary one uh, is, it'll read zero, one, two, three, four, and this is supposed to be an analysis and damage report of some kind. I, it's not fully simulated if simulated at all. And then auxiliary two is your Doppler test. The top digit should read 217 plus or minus 13. The lower digit should read 47 plus or minus nine. And then auxiliary three is your own ground speed. Currently we are not moving. Auxiliary four is pitch and roll in degrees and minutes. Auxiliary 5 is a visual test. Everything will illuminate on the Nazir screen. And then Auxiliary 6 is a uh, basically a distance measuring tool. So it'll measure distance while you're moving in meters on the X and Y axis. And in order to stop this test, you'll hit the 7 key. Moving on, 
The IC button, I don't believe it is simulated, as far as I'm tracking. And then you have uh, geographical button GOUTM. This swaps between lat long and UTM. Your UTM reads out on the X and Y axis, and if you hit the down arrow, you'll get the UTM zone. And position fix is of so very little use that I'm not even going to bother covering this in this tutorial. Moving on though, we have the gel freeze button. This is basically a copy paste feature. So if we had, uh, for example, waypoint two, and we wanted to move this to waypoint three, we would select waypoint two, hit gel, three, enter. And now we can see that two has been copied to three as well. So the same can actually be done with our current position. If we want to copy our current position into a waypoint, we can select the PP parameter mode, select freeze, switch back to BUT, select whatever waypoint we want to paste this into. We're going to go with three, enter. And that is our current position pasted into waypoint three. The only remaining function we have left to cover here is the puller button. And this is an extremely useful feature for plotting targets as waypoints using the Vivian camera system in conjunction with the Nadir. We'll cover that a bit later when we're up in the air. Last thing I want to cover is the test function for the Nadir. If you switch the knob from land to test, the, this, uh, the screen will go blank, you'll get your flags back. Pan will display for 10 seconds. ERR, nav, and air will stay displayed. And in addition to that, if we look at our Nadir ADF compass here and distance to waypoint indicator, uh, this should be 45 degrees offset to the right from the 12 o'clock position. We will get the BUT flag and the PX flag here and 50 kilometers should be displayed under that flag. All right, guys, as a practical demonstration, I've uh, put in a waypoint for waypoint two. We're headed there now. We can see that the Nadir ADF gauge is showing our Nadir needle is at our 12 o'clock, indicating that we are headed towards it. And we're 3.9 kilometers away from that waypoint, 3.8. If we switch to TPS cap mode, we can see that our heading to that waypoint is 303 degrees, and we're mo one minute away from that waypoint. And we're now reading zero minutes away from that waypoint. We're only 1.3 kilometers out. And now if we stay in TPS cap mode, I just want to demonstrate changing waypoints with the destination key. Uh, so we're, we're almost on this waypoint. It's the end of this runway right here. So let's say we've reached our waypoint and we want to switch to the next one. All we have to do without even changing back to BUT parameter mode is hit the destination key, the waypoint we want to switch to, and hit enter. And now I'm reading that the next waypoint is heading 317 for three minutes. It's 7.7 kilometers away. So it occurred to me during editing that I neglected to actually show you guys how to enter a waypoint. So we're going to do that now. I've selected this waypoint over here, this building, and that is 7.3 kilometers on a track heading of 315 degrees. So the coordinates at this location are 43300 by 39536. And we'll just hop back in the cockpit and demonstrate that now. So we'll select a random waypoint. Say we want to enter this under waypoint 5. And then we hit the enter key. Delete, delete, delete using the EFF key. 43300. Hit the down arrow. 3953. Decimal 6. Hit the enter key. And that is our new waypoint stored under waypoint 5.
We can verify that is on a heading of 309 for 7.2 kilometers. And just to demonstrate to the fullest degree, I'll fly over there. Hey guys, I'm uh, headed towards the waypoint now. And as I go that direction, I just kind of wanted to discuss my plans and aspirations for the channel. I'm not doing this in any sort of serious capacity, however, I still want to produce content that is worthy and provides value to the community. That being said, I will be posting videos on a very irregular basis, uh, and I hope you enjoy the content, and once it becomes feasible to do so, if ever, I plan to do some giveaways and uh, buy some modules for some people, so hopefully we can do that sooner than later. In addition, I'll also add that I believe there are content creators who are far more dedicated to content creation than myself, such as Casmo, uh, Volk, and VS Terminus. Uh, they, they really bring a lot to the table, and I would highly recommend subscribing to them. Alright, we have reached our waypoint. Let's verify on the map that we're in the correct location. And indeed we are. Alright guys, thanks for watching.